Hello, everybody. Uh, just to give you some background in terms of my history, I probably graduated before David did, I'm that old. But I was at uni in the 70s where paediatric dentistry involved the use of amalgam, intric intricately carved and polished, and if you exposed a pulp straight into a former cresol pulpotomy. And in the 80s, that changed somewhat. Amalgam went out and they did composites, but they still did vital pulpotomies with former cresol. Suddenly in the, uh, in the 90s, GIC started to creep in. In the late 90s and early 2000s, we started seeing other alternative MID practices to try and treat dental caries. The point I make, though, is when I was at uni, I was taught by Graham Craig to do a silver fluoride uh, application to caries, uh, whether you were multiple caries lesions, and that involved silver fluoride and a stannous fluoride slurry, an or adhesive bandage left on the kid's tooth for an hour. It gave amazing results. The kids came back for recalls, those, that caries had been arrested. Unfortunately, what happened in the, in the, uh, in the 90s, there was a, an article in the ADJ, and quite rightly, they raised some concerns about the amount of fluoride kids were ingesting from, from silver fluoride. I think those issues have been resolved to some extent now, I'm pleased to say, and we're moving ahead with probably looking at the use of silver fluoride. I will recognise here that we are supported in this research program by SDI, and I'm working with UTAS, and that's Associate Professor Len Crocombe from UTAS. So I recognise both of those guys. Look, that's a common sight we all see, unfortunately, in everyday practice in the public sector. It's frustrating, it's heartbreaking, and we all know that awful sound of deciduous teeth that are being extracted under GAs tinkling in a stainless steel kidney, kidney dish bowl. It's a dreadful sound. And I know that theatre staff who are non-dental who see that freak out. So what do we do about that? Uh, yes, we know what causes it. The common sign in Woolworths, or I shouldn't say just Woolworths, any, anyone, and it's diametrically opposed. And we're trying to deal with that now as well. Um, this is something that Peter Walsh, who was a finance minister in the, in the 90s, said, dental treatment has the potential to be a bottomless fiscal pit. I don't think federal governments of all persuasions actually have changed their mind much since then. Um, he was, in, this came from a book he wrote called The Confessions of a, fi a Failed Finance Minister. It's an interesting comment though because we also tackle politically the issues around we have a responsibility as practitioners to try and reduce disease. We can't just rely on governments keep on funding us. So I think as we as, as dental practitioners also have a, a role to play in trying to reduce disease and reduce the costs of dental treatment. Uh, we all know that you know, the, the extent of, of host, uh, oral health diseases as preventable hospital admissions and the data around that and you know the amount of expenditure on dentistry. In 2012, the AIHW data saying that something like $8.3 billion was spent in dentistry. Unfortunately, of that $8.3 billion, 75% was in the private sector. So let's talk a bit about silver fluoride. Um, it's actually some pretty significant evidence now saying that the application, and we're talking about the one-off one application of silver, silver fluoride, silver diamine fluoride I'm talking about, is actually more effective than a a three-monthly application of sodium fluoride, which we all use as Durafat or Curacept or whatever it might be. Um, that research is getting pretty well validated now. And also, the, there's no st statistical difference uh, with those kids that have had uh, silver fluoride and who, um, between children, had their caries excavated prior to the, the uh, application of silver diamine fluoride. So the po point there is, that they're not excavating caries, they're cleaning and they're putting the silver fluoride in there, the silver diamine fluoride. And also, one of the issues they did have with silver fluoride, using it exclusively, was it did turn the lesion black. And Graham Craig used to say to the students, if it's not black, it hasn't worked. And that was quite right, but obviously, unfortunately, there were some aesthetic issues around the use of, of silver fluoride and the blackness. They didn't seem to worry about stainless steel crowns anymore, but they worried about the blackness. And um, so they did look at some research about the use of potassium iodide, and the object with a potassium iodide was actually, after you put the silver fluoride in there, you actually put the potassium iodide in there, which causes a white precipitate, 
and then you wait till that white precipitate turns quite clear, then you wash that off, and there you don't have as black a lesion. And a bit of a, I'm a bit of a fan of Jeff Knight. He's done a lot of work around this. He wrote an article, I think, back in 2006 called The Silver Bullet. And people who actually didn't take much notice of it, they are starting to take some notice of it now, though. So I would recommend that if you haven't read that article, you, you need to, it's, it was in the ADJ, I think, back in 2006. The other thing that he made a point was that potassium iodide has a significant antibacterial effect. Uh, the worry about using silver, uh, potassium iodide after silver fluoride, the concern was you reduce the antibacterial effect of the silver fluoride itself. So that was significant, that the potassium iodide did have a significant antibacterial effect. And then we looked at, and this is part of our research, and I'll go into that a bit further, but there was the use of putting a GIC over the top of the treated tooth with silver, silver diamine fluoride and potassium iodide. And we know about the effect of GICs in terms of just their fluoride content and the release of their fluorides. The interesting part about covering the treated tooth with the GIC is there's evidence now that that silver fluoride will actually penetrate further down the dentine tubules. Um, and so therefore we've got some evidence that actually it's more beneficial to actually cover it with a glass iron and a cement. Um, yeah, so look, getting on to our study in Tassie, in, in the South Island, um, we're actually looking at a control group with, silver, uh, with uh, flo uh, sodium fluoride. And the uh, first group will be silver diamine fluoride. This third group will be silver diamine fluoride with GIC. And the last group will be silver diamine fluoride, potassium iodide with GIC. So we're actually looking at f really four groups, the control group being really the silver, the um, uh, sodium fluoride or durafat. I mean, we're talking about kids here. I suppose the other interest in, in terms of long-term research and where we may well move to is the use of silver fluoride in aged care facilities with that, you know, that dry mouth that I've got now and that, sig that significant amount of, of cervical caries that it, it occurs and how we actually look after those guys because um, as Clive Wright always says, these pa patients are going to all have teeth when, when we, we are in those aged care facilities. That's how we look after those guys. And I think silver fluoride might take a very significant role uh, with this, the GIC over it, looking after those guys. <laughs> and I'm very close to it. I mentioned the, the control groups, um, uh, the, the st uh, uh, sodium fluoride and the other three other groups, that, the intervention groups. I suppose just, and I'll put this up just to let you have a quick look at the treat treatment protocols which we've done, which we intend to start actually next week. Um, a couple of things we noticed with the use of it, and I did mention the SDI is providing this, but one of the things we noticed when we opened the silver diamine fluoride capsule is because of the diamine, it actually smells of ammonia, and it can be quite distressing if you're opening that next to the kid and you mix it with a bit of a micro brush, that smell can be really quite awful. So we, we actually got the, the guys now to move that away when they first open it and actually use the, the, uh, the, the micro brush so it's, it's less effective on the kids. Um, isolation just with cotton rolls and with the mandible garments clamps. And again, talked about the, the, um, all the same sort of treatment protocols with the application of 35% phosphoric acid, and then rinsing. But in this case, we're talking about the resin-modified GIC put over that particular treated tooth. And again, and I do believe passionately, this does have the opportunity for us, if it's used in the right treatment for the right patient, if it's used, it could dramatically change what we can do. It is another tool in MID, it's not a panacea, I think fluoride varnish is also a tool. Stainless steel crowns are also a tool. I think this is another tool that we can actually help kids who have got a symptomless caries lesion and maybe numerous caries lesions to actually give those kids some sort of support without the need for a general anaesthetic. And I do question, and this is controversial to some extent, why if we treated the whole lot of these D's and E's with a silver fluoride GIC, do we actually really still need stainless steel crowns? 
And that's my home, the beautiful Huon Valley in Tasmania. Thank you.